Oh, hi there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 242. That's dos, cuatro, dos. How are you guys doing? Como estas? Bien? Amazing. How am I feeling? Perfecto, actually. Thank you for asking. I'm feeling good, man. As per usual, this is Sober October month. I got back from a good workout. I'm feeling strong. I'm feeling powerful. I'm going to do um, two workouts a day because I mentioned before, Monday and Fridays are my um, dub two a days because I want to ensure I have a solid week. And then if I go off the rails on a Saturday, on a Sunday, I can do. Obviously, I'm not doing that because it's Sober October, but I'm trying to set up a structure where I have two a days on a Monday and two a days on a Friday. So I'm basically bookending um, my workouts in a good way so that it can set a good precedent and set a good little mind. I can have a good mindset going into the weekend because I've already done two a days on a Monday and a Friday. It's unlikely that I'm going to go too crazy on a Friday and Sunday because I don't want to start back again from like minus 10. I want to start from like, I want to restart my workout week on a good level. So it's going to make me kind of um, cognitively aware of what I've done previously and not to kind of undo all my good work from the previous weeks or from the week that I've just done it, right? So I'm feeling good, feeling strong, feeling powerful. Like I said, I've got a workout today I did. I'm going to go probably do a running workout at the evening when I go back from work. I'm going to probably do some sprinting training around where I live. There's like a little circle thing that I run around, probably do an 800 meter sprint. That'll probably work out, no, 400 meter sprint, sorry, that'll work out pretty well. A couple of those and then come back, change and then see how the rest of my evening goes. But how are you guys doing? Okay, good? Boom, banging. I'm, I've been pumping out the podcast these couple of, past couple of weeks, which is no... It shouldn't be no surprise though, really, innit? The moment you take away something like going out and drugs and alcohol is the moment suddenly your fucking horizons open up and you start to do the things that you should be doing, right? Number one, like reading, right? I've just about finished um, this book, Gomorrah, from the hit TV show, Gomorrah. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. It's on Sky Atlantic now at the moment. Can you see that, right? Can you see that? Can you see that? Yep, 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 yep. Um, just about finished that. I've finished reading so many books on my iPhone. It's not even funny. Like, really? I've got a few of them I've taken off my iPhone. I've re- I've finished listening to The Obstacle. Um, sorry, Still Listen to the Key by Ryan Holiday, which is really good. I'm going to get a physical copy of that. Um, I've just started reading the Edward Snowden book, as you can see there, via my phone. Um, what else have I read? I finished quite a lot of books, actually. I don't know what. I think I've taken most of them off my phone. Um, yeah, I have, haven't I? I finished that. What else I finished? I finished another book as well. Oh, I just got a few, actually. Forget all that stuff. I've got some more books that I'm going to power bang out until the end of the year. Again, I, I kept saying I'm going to read four books a month. But I think going through now, I'm just going to read as many as I can. I'm just going to get through them. And when I finish them, buy some more. I'm not going to just stop myself from the four weeks. Because I, I can generally get through quite a few books in four weeks anyway. And if, I, if I'm reading like an hour to work, an hour back from work, um, and whatever, 40 minutes on lunch break after I finish eating my food, I like to kind of, you know, then I don't like to eat and then read. It kind of is a bit annoying because you always have to fold the book and it's just hard to do it. And you might end up with food all over your pages. So I tend to just like quickly eat my stuff, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, and then have the rest of the time to read. So hour to work, hour back from work, 40 minutes at lunch. And then, of course, anytime I'm at home, so maybe in the morning, I try and put in like a quick half an hour and rip, smash with some pages. Um, sometimes walking to work as well from the station, you can quickly smash out a few pages too. Um, loads of events, you can, loads of occasions, especially in the weekends too, when I wake up a bit late, I can just lie in bed and just like turn my lamp on and just switch through pages. So it's quite easy to get through a couple of pages of a book. But again, it means you're going to have to exchange your smartphone for a book. All the habits that you usually have in terms of grabbing your smartphone, just take your book out. And you'll be able to um, well, take your book out sounds like something else, doesn't it? But I don't mean that. But take your book out, especially like if you're going to the toilet or something um, and you're going to, you know, ha- have, a, have a little shit and probably take your book with you and then you can probably smash through a few pages of that um, when you're sat there. And I've got a few more I bought, actually. A few more books I've bought. If you're interested to check them out, I'm going to show you anyway, so you've got no choice. But um, uh, first three, I'm going to develop into three, make it easy. I've got three books here. I've got six overall I'm going to be reading in these next few weeks. Can you see that? Right? Can, can, you, can you see that? Can you see this? Can you see this? Right? Can you? There we go. Let me put it up to the camera. Okay, cool. There. Got it. So, I've got three books. Number one, I've got Ernest Hemingway, The Old Man in the Sea. I've had this on my um, watch list or my Amazon watch list, wish list for a while. Um, I've been trying to get for as many Ernest Hemingway books as I can. They're usually quite small, usually quite thin, extremely well written. And just, you know, it's good to kind of get into something that isn't, you know, my usual self-help book shit. So that's nice, right? Old, the old man in the sea. So check that out. Then I've got William Gibson's Pattern Recognition. I got recommended this, I think, via listening to the uh, GQ Style podcast. 
I think they mentioned this recently in passing, so I'm just going to quickly smash through that. It's three in the series, Spook Country and Zero History. So I'm just going to finish all these and see how good William Gibson is as, uh, as an author. And, you know, whether or not it's my cup of tea. Again, I don't read many novels, but, you know, here we go. And then I've got another book, of course, right into my wheelhouse of the stuff that I kind of like. If you know, I like, I'm really very much interested into the seedy underbelly of the drug industry and just how people go about kind of functioning in that area. The different personalities and just the amount of money that gets funneled through, how it doesn't really get stopped, the war on drugs. There's just so many things, so many social political things that you can learn uh, through drugs. Similar, like, um, I think similar, similar vein to, I was listening to, there's this, a YouTube channel called The Whiskey Vault and The Whiskey Tribe. I recommend you check them out if you're a fan of whiskey. And they essentially are just whiskey sommeliers who kind of review whiskeys. They also have their own um, liquor store in Texas where they kind of, you know, again, stock and sell loads of whiskeys. They have their own brand of whiskey that they sell. And they just generally are very informative. They've made a whole community around whiskey. And it's really informative, really cool. But I got um, the um, one of the guys there who I think is accredited sommelier, He's very much, or both of the dudes actually that present on the show, they are, um, they have a good, they have a very good, um, they're very worldly, especially even for, even more so for Americans. And I'm sure lots of it has to do with the fact that they're really into whiskey. Getting into whiskey, I suddenly got, you know, you go down a rabbit hole, as they always say in a sh on the show. Um, and you start kind of thinking about loads of different reasons that, loads of different things that might contribute to why this whiskey tastes the way it does. The history, when it was founded, what happened when it was founded, who the founders were, what they were going through, loads of interesting things. You can just go deeper and deeper and deeper until you get to a point where, you know, you are then, you know, kind of brewing your, or kind of making your own whiskey. So I guess this, I won't make my own cocaine, I guess in some regard, but I'll get an understanding of how these big operators who are quite talented in one area, but choose to unfortunately do it if in an area that's um, dealing with illicit drugs, but how they go about kind of, you know, making this candy machine keep rolling on. And the book is actually called Candy Machine. It's called How Cocaine Took Over the World. And it's by a guy called Tom Feeling. So if you want to check that out, you can too. I haven't read it yet. I just got it in today from Amazon. Um, then the next three books I have here are rather interesting, really different all in all. There's two hardbacks, right? Two hardback books there and one paperback. The paperback book to start off with is by Stephen Fry, absolute legend. I'm sure you guys are familiar, UK guys are familiar with Stephen Fry and probably a few US people too um, due to his collaborations with Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson in the last few years. He did an interview with Dave Rubin too, but just a really um, funny, quick-witted, charismatic, intelligent I mean, obviously intelligent kind of um, philosopher, uh, for lack of a better term, in the UK. I mean, you've written this book called um, Heroes, Mortals and Monsters, The Quest for Adventures. At the back, it says there are heroes and then there are Greek heroes. Join Jason aboard uh, the Argos as he seeks the Golden Fleece and see Atlanta outrun all men before being tricked with golden apples. Soldier through the Heracles uh, 12 labors. Uh, shiver in terror under the stone cold gaze of Medusa and witness wily op 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 obsidious or odious oedipus oedipus sorry solve the <laughs> the riddle of the sphinx from white knuckle chases to twisting labyrinths impossible puzzles to blood curling monsters heroes is filled with dramatic funny tragic and timeless tales of what we mortal men and women are truly capable of at our heroic best so yeah definitely i'm definitely looking forward to, to reading this i think it's gonna be really funny loads of probably giggle moments in that and then i've got two very interesting books of the of the moment um, got Catch and Kill by Ronan Farrow. He was a dude that was um, basically instrumental in kind of putting to piecing together the story um, to do with uh, Harvey Weinstein and all the Me Too stuff. So he's basically put it all into a book, which is essentially kind of, you know, deals with the whole issue. Um, and the subtitle is called Lies, Spies, Conspiracy to Protect the Prote Predators. So it's going to be very enlightening to kind of read this entire book. Um, and then, of course, uh, the legendary Elton John autobiography called Me, which I'm sure has been serialized a few times on, on on the media. I'm sure you guys are aware of it, but I'm, you get to check out what it's like. Oh, look at the back cover of him performing. Where is that? Is that Wembley Arena? Oof, look at that. Mamma mia. So, yeah, rec rec you get to check out all, all six books between now and maybe the end of November. I probably should get through all of these. So, again, going forward, I'm going to try and make a review of all the books I read. And make sure that I let you guys know what I think of them. Any kind of tidbits I got from them that are very insightful. But, you know, they're all very good books on the, on the, on the just on the surface. I think I'm going to get something out of everything. And hopefully I can then apply those knowledges or insights into my everyday life. Because that's what it's about, isn't it? If you don't do that, what's the point? Um, so, yeah, um, let's move on. So, um, what we have going on, talking, talking, we have a lot to talk about today. We have some stuff about Kanye. Some stuff about Joe Rogan, stuff about that, stuff about this. But before we begin, 
I need to let you guys know. I want to watch the Joker. I watched the Joker. I watched the Joker movie the other day. Um, it was really good, and I've kind of been meditating or thinking about it ever since. Um, it's probably the first movie in a long time where you kind of leave and you're not, you're not happy, and you're not sad. You're just like indifferent. Not indifferent. You're just like, you're just flat, right? You're just flat. Um, you don't know what to really think. You don't know how to react. You don't know whether or not you should. You, you don't know whether or not you should clap or not, right? And I'm sure everyone that's watched the movie will know, can attest to what I mean. But um, I gotta get just get some background images to make sure this kind of looks entertaining. But um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure what to think, man. I think um, to start off with, I think Todd Phillips did a great job. I think anyone that was doubting that he could um do that kind of cinema has been proved completely wrong. Of course, if you look at his INDB and you look at the stuff that he's done previously, like The Hangover, you might think, mm, you know, how's this guy going to make such a dark and bleak movie, a thriller that such as this, and make it good? Well, I think we got proven wrong, right? He proved everyone wrong. He delivered on his promise to really do justice um, with the Joker story. And again, it's not, it's unlike anything we've seen before in any other kind of Marvel or DC-based uh, movie. It's just um, there's so much depth to it. You end up rooting for a very despicable, deplorable character in the movie. You end up rooting for him and you end up trying to reason and sympathize with what he's going through or emp empathize with it. And I think nowadays, especially um, there's another book coming out too that I haven't checked out yet called um, Antisocial. I forgot the author's name, but he was recently on Sam Harris's podcast and he had a very, I don't know, combative conversation, even though it was very respectful. But he has written a book where he kind of uh, spotlighted or highlighted a lot of the trolls and from the right wing scene, from the conservative side who are effect who effectively, you know, um, who are responsible for putting Donald Trump in, in power in some way, shape or form, right? Through their, you know, use of social media. And there's a lot of it. And I think throughout the entire conversation with Sam Harris, there was this friction between this guy that wrote this book called Antisocial because he obviously deplores, he usually doesn't think much of these trolls. But Sam Harris is very empathetic about where they come from, right? About understanding what got them to this position of like, you know, being an anti-Semite or wanting to be a radical nationalist, right? Or, you know, whatever, or shouting along the street, the Jews will not replace us, all that sort of shit. Um, Sam Harris is very, is, is very empathetic of it, and the author isn't. And it got me thinking that maybe movies like this are kind of an indication of it in terms of like, you know, every week you see someone like John Oliver or, you know, whoever it is on those late night TV shows, every fucking night, actually, they're going at Donald Trump, they're calling him names, they're insinuating his base are idiots, like just continue abuse, isn't it? And of course, he's done a lot of bad things, but you start to think about like how, what's the best method to get someone like that out of power, or what's the best way to try to convert them or bring them onto your side? And it's not probably it's probably not that, is it? But it's the same sort of like heavy-handed approach they do with cast cancel culture, right? Someone says something that you don't like, someone says something that that doesn't really ring true to your ideology or doesn't represent your group, and you want them to never speak again, which is not necessarily the way to go about things, right? You want to you in a in a in a normal, in a civil society, you want to educate the person, right? You want to shame them out of it, out of their idiotic position. That's that's exactly what you want. But in an era where shame is non-existent and people don't, people want to embrace their not people. People want to be celebrated for their not so noble acts. Um, so it's quite quite hard to be, you know, inclusive of everybody, celebrate everyone's weirdness and sometimes you know really reprehensible behavior and then also saying at the, from the same mouth oh we need to bring shame back so people can get really habilitated it's really hard to occupy that position and i think the joker did a really good job of kind of questioning all that stuff right because it's quite evident watching the film joker that he's who he is because the stuff has happened to him it's not because he's a bad kid unless you believe that bad kids exist which i don't i'm not sure where i sit on that on that fence yet what side of the fence i sit on with that kind of issue because i remember reading or listening to somebody mentioning on a podcast that they spoke to a, a counselor for children or something along the lines of that, and at, at like a young at middle school or maybe a primary school. No, it might have been like a reception or nursery, and they said to the parent that there are there is such a thing as bad kids that they've worked in the industry long enough to know that no ma no amount of counseling, no amount of mentorship, no amount of guidance can deter a bad kid from turning into a bad adult. It's just going to be one of those things, right? Whether they're just you know whether they're a liar, a cheater, um, whether they just don't do nothing, lazy, or whatever it may be, whether they commit a crime, whether they're violent, um, whether they're abusive, these things will just happen um, because it's just something that's just part of their personality in the same way that somebody is very bubbly and somebody is very introverted. Um, but I don't know where I sit on that so far. I still think that a lot of it has to do with nurture. 
I still think as you know, we all have members in our family who are not the people that you'd want to hang around with, you know, day to day, but you know, they're tolerable. I think people can be tolerable, but I think nowadays in this era, I think you're taught not to be tolerable. You're taught to be just like, you know, look at people like Trisha Paytas as a YouTuber as a good example. Like, you know, she's in an industry where essentially she's being rewarded for how much of a shitty person she is, right? So why would she, Why, as much as people don't like her, why would she, and say, oh, you should tone it down and stop being such a drama queen and she's annoying. Why would she stop? Why would she not? Why would she stop being annoying? Like it's obviously doing very well for her, right? She's getting paid a lot of money for it, um, brand deals and um, AdSense and you know whatever it may be. They're, they're all coming her way, so it makes more sense for her to kind of just stay on that track. Obviously, for the audience, it's annoying, but I think this Joker movie kind of throws up all those questions and fucking you know leaves you with absolutely no answers. Um, again, expertly shot, really cool movie. I have nothing but good things to say about it. Um, I'm so tempted to go watch it again. Um, I don't know whether or not that's a good idea and whether or not it will kind of lose its shine because I think a lot of the stuff that happened in the movie um, happened because I generally, generally outside of the first trailer and watching maybe 30 seconds of it, I'd seen nothing else about the Joker. Nothing. Zero. I didn't know even what he was going to wear. I knew nothing. Well, I knew it was Joaquin Phoenix got really skinny for the role. On Joaquin Phoenix as well, by the way. Wow. What a performance. What a performance. Um, actors in general nowadays, I don't know whether or not acting is like as a role, as a job, has kind of went through a bit of a shitty time and people don't really appreciate the talent or the ability that it takes to be a really good actor. But when you watch... Yeah, you know what it is? I think when you watch stuff like Power and Empire, which is not... Again, I don't blame them because it's no, it's cable TV and shit. But when you watch stuff like that and then you go to watch that and then you go to watch The Joker, you realise the levels in acting. You realise what the levels are. Like There are some people... There's just no amount of writing is going to make you um, Whacking Phoenix level performer, unfortunately. Um, so that makes you maybe makes you appreciate it in general but i think just because you i think as well the main thing that really makes you appreciate is when you watch the interview with the actors and you start to realize that they are nothing like the person that they portrayed on screen of course we know this prior because it's, a, it's it, we know it because it's in the fucking name of the occupation but sometimes you forget you lose sight of just you, what where they have to go in order to kind of make these movies and i don't know if working Vince is ever going to be the same again after doing this role like is that are you capable to kind of come out of it or is this something that you or is this something that you have buried deep down in you? Or, is this, or maybe that's why The Joker is such a good movie. Because we all have that, let's just burn it all to the ground thing in us. And that's where maybe, which is funny because a lot of the um, social justice warrior types or the people on the left, the, you know, the kind of work people were trying to counsel this movie because they thought it was going to encourage incels, which, you know, you never know. It might do, it might not. But the funny thing about it is that I sometimes think that some of those people in those groups that identify that kind of ideology have that burning desire in them to kind of burn it all to the ground because they think you know we've done such a we, they think modern civil modern civilization has done such a bad job of kind of you know taking us of basically where we are now is kind of responsible for where we are this fuck up position that we're in their eyes so they would naturally think that if you just burn it all to the ground and start again everything will be back to normal and would be back to balance and would be fair again i don't know but i think if anything the Joker represents a duality of like number one, an insult or a troll that those people are afraid of, and also the woke um, social justice warrior types. It, it represents that duality. Whether, whether you believe it's Arthur, as in when he is, you know, without the face paint, or whether it's Joker himself, but it's an amazing movie, man. A really fucking good movie. Um, so good is the movie that now that those stairs that he runs down and starts doing the dance um, has now turned into a tourist spot, which is fucking insane, right? <laughs> Because it's not even the most... Even the, the movie makes it look shit. It looks really, like, stark and bleak. And he, whenever he's walking up the stairs, there's, there's hardly anyone walking down it. And he's having to traipse up all these stairs. So it's fucking horrible. But um, it looks even worse in real life. It looks fucking long. The longest stairs you've seen in your entire life, right? And it's the kind of stairs that you have to go up on. Because there's no other way to get from where you are to where it is up there. Like, they purposely been put there to in order to kind of help the local community but it's an absolute scourge on everyone's life isn't it um and uh, they turn it into like a fucking tourist spot and here it is here right i saw, I saw this fucking thread on twitter which is absolutely nuts <clears throat> actually uh, a post on sorry a post on vulture's kind of rounded up but this is absolutely crazy so vulture has it here an article says uh an afternoon at the joker stairs new york's newest tourist attraction and the article says the following um when when the location managers guild hands out its annual awards next year they may have to hard time overlooking joker for the film's gritty kitchen sink depiction of gotham city director todd phillips 
it's skewed um sound stages preferring real locations in brooklyn oh yeah that was a really good thing he did too i think i watched a video of his on rolling stone where he kind of broke down every scene bit by bit and how little of the scenes in joker were cgi most of them were real scenes with just the background sort of filled in to make sure it kind of matches the, the era he was kind of going for um in particular the latter is a, a back to outgoing in particular the latter is a home to a steep outdoor staircase where Joaquin phoenix joker celebrates his descent into villainy with a limb falling crack thrusting dance is set to gary glitter's rock and roll part two it's a scene that carries real cinematic power which means it's almost instantaneously turned into a meme the gary glitter thing was a bit of a risky move too in it because obviously he's in prison for you know sexually assault in kids and i'm pretty sure he's, he's on a sexual sexual um the child sex offenders list aka he's a nonce so imagine using that movie i didn't even realize it at the time but when i when i checked the soundtrack i was like oh shit i don't know how they got away with that one i think maybe people are too outraged about the insult um undertones to kind of you know really keep an eye on that one but that's probably more egregious than the you know than the supposed incel vibe the film gives off because you know guy glitter's got a fucking rap sheet on him like to say the least Anyway, it continues. Um, it's a scene that carries real cinematic power, which means it's almost instantaneously turned into a meme. Now visitors have found the real steps and they are started showing up in their droves. On weekends, crowds began arriving and this unassuming corner of the Bronx has early as 9 o'clock in the morning. On the sunny October Sunday, the stairs, which are located in the Shakespeare Avenue of Highbridge, right? Which if you know, if you're familiar with rappers, you know that Highbridge is home to Don Q and A Boogie. So not the most, you know... Um, tourist friendly spots if you've seen any of their entourages uh, it continues here many film locations look less grand in real life but the joker steps remain as imposing as they do on, on screen looming over the bodegas of jerome avenue with their narrow vertical orientation the stairs are perfectly suited for the age of instagram story they're new for oh yeah because it's because it's perfectly vertical and it's really steep too so you can probably get it you can probably get a whole shot of the, the bottom to the top of the stairs in one square instagram post um blah 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 Instagram story, da, da, da. they're just a short few week, a short walk away from the 17th Street 4th Station, itself only one step away from the Yankee Stadium. If you're in the sociological mood, you could say that the influx of tourists serves as a reminder of how self-enforcing cycles of low crime and gentrification, as well as certain internet-enabled frictionless, the stairs have been say, uh, tagged in Google Maps, have combined to break down notions of which urban neighborhoods are off-limits to newcomers. Instagram makes flaneurs of us all. But imagine that. Look at this. There's an image here on Instagram of some. It looks like a Japanese dude at the bottom of the stairs. I'm not sure if it's Japanese or Chinese. And the caption says the following: "I'm pretty sure I must be the first Asian YouTuber to visit here. LOL. Look at the lovely Joker at the Joker stairs at Bronx. <laughs> and he's written in another language too. It must be Russian or something. That's pretty cool there. Someone, someone came dressed up in a Joker outfit, which is fucking bizarre. Imagine going up with your bodega shopping." going back to your apartment and having to see all these absolute numb nuts going to a tourist destination and doing all this stuff like the kind of person that does this is also the kind of person that asks for a dj for a request i guarantee you anyone that's willing to go to a location and look at the thing and look at something because it's been in the movie you are i don't know man i don't know what, you, what you'd call that person but not my friend like that's for sure definitely not my friend like how is that a thing even if i was even if i happened to be because Okay, this Asian YouTuber, obviously, he's a YouTuber. He's probably doing really well for himself. He can travel all over the world. Good deal on you. Buy a ticket. Go to New... You you know, it's it's not a bad thing to go to New York in the middle of fucking, you know, October and go and hang out on, uh, on a set of The Joker, right? Or at an iconic scene of The Joker. But I don't know. Even if I happened to be in New York and I didn't know about the movie and I just you know happened to be in New York, I didn't know the stairs were there, I wouldn't take a picture. I'll just keep it moving. Oh, yeah, cool. Those are stairs and then go about my day. There's more interesting things to do than be standing at some fucking stairs with, with an outfit on pretending you're in a Joker. That is like some basic bitch behavior, no? Like, not a fan at all. And again, how long is that video? Nine minutes? Two minutes? Four minutes? Hey, hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Here I am at the Joker stairs. You can see the stairs behind me right now. Here's people walking by it. Oh, look, there's a girl dressed up like a Joker there. <laughs> so funny, man. These kids these days. Anyway, like and subscribe. It's like, how long can that video be? Like, really, how long can that video be? It's like, it's the stairs from the Joker. Cool. But that's it, no? Bloody hell. Anyway, um, it continues. On their Showtime show Monday night, Jesus and Mira, both of whom grew up in the Bronx, devoted a segment to the stairs with Jesus affecting the persona of a Swiss tourist. Okay, cool. We don't want to read that. But yeah, loads of images of people going to the stairs and sitting on it, which is, and doing their thing. Here's another fucking numb nuts dressed up at the Joker doing it. There's going to be so many Joker outfits in for Halloween too, innit? Oh, Halloween, Halloween. God Almighty, one of the worst holidays ever. One of the worst fucking days to party in the world, isn't it? 
full of absolute donuts. But yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be horrendous. Isn't it? Everyone dressed up as a Joker, but <sighs> people are, there's so many basic bitches in the world, and it's just like men and women, man. Like <sighs> yeah, so Todd Phillips did did a good thing. He created a cultural moment, and cultural moments are is a, a meme moment might be more has has more weight to it an actual cultural moment maybe in this generation. It might be it might have more press, it might have more weight to it. You know what I mean? You can share it online. You can tag your friends in it geolocation but yeah well done to Todd Phillips and the team they smashed it Joker movie is incredible so much so I might go watch it again if I don't watch Ad Astra first um, but yeah great movie great fucking movie man and again made me question a lot of things whether or not we had that ability to kind of tap into that villainy and insanity within ourselves and whether or not you know kids can grow up kids are born evil or just grow up to be evil or grow up to be bad kids, let's say, for lack of a better term. Bad kids is probably a better term. Evil, you know, probably has a lot more weight to it. Um, uh, baggage or whatever it may be. But yeah, um, check it out, man. Joker's out at the moment. If you haven't watched it, I don't know what you're doing. Get on board. Jump on it. Get on board. Get on board. Next on the list, what do we have? What do we have? Let's let's move on from that one. Oh, T-Pain cancelled his tour, which is a... Um, I don't know why this is... No, I know why it's is big news, but the interesting thing about T-Pain cancelling the tour is that people are surprised that he'd come out and tell, tell the truth about why exactly it got cancelled. Um, I read between the lines that supposedly good, the tour got cancelled because got of low, news. Let me pause the video because of low ticket sales, um, and also because he didn't basically market the event um, uh, with enough time in advance. And I know all all about that, having put on a few of my nights. I know that there is a thing when you are an artist or you're an entertainer or you're a promoter, you do sometimes, you do sometimes um, forget just how difficult it was to get the first couple of people to come to your first few events. The moment you have the first good event that goes really well and you get a high turnout, you then tend to think that that is an accurate representation of where your party, your level of artistry, your uh, ability to pull a crowd, you, you assume that is where it's at when it's not really that. It's usually probably two or so events uh, before that. That's where you're kind of level at or you kind of average out of that way. So you tend to sometimes take a bit, a few liberties, right? Not promote it as much as you did previously, not share it on social, not going to hand out flyers, not giving enough, enough time to just market it in general and get it sorted out and announced. So again, um, especially nowadays with the short attention spans, you really, I think people have a short attention spans, yes, but that means you have to be very, very purposeful um, and you have to, you have, to have a, a clear plan in your head with your team about how you want to roll out everything that you do, whether it's an album, um, whether it's a mixtape, whether it's an event, whether it's an appearance, everything needs to be everything needs to be kind of worked out. So if I was an artist, if I was a manager of an artist and they went and had an interview with Ibra in the morning, had an interview with Breakfast Club, had an interview with, um, uh, I don't know, Two Shots of Tequila, Mixed Race, whatever, the Half Cast podcast, sorry, and all those kind of dudes. I would have found something in place for my artists where if they happen to have like a memeable moment or a, sh a viral moment where there'd be like a rollout in place for each scenario. You know how I think I've, I feel, I've heard a story, I think recently now in the Sam Harris podcast, supposedly the New York Times um, kind of a representation of just how people are so unprepared and lacking in foresight. The New York Times or that kind of liberal elite media or the kind of MSM, the mainstream media, they were so... Um, caught up in their own little bubble, right? That they were, un they 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 didn't even um, theorize or didn't even hypothesize or even mull over the idea that Donald Trump could have won the election, right? When he was facing off against Hillary, so the New York Times didn't even prepare a cover of them of their newspaper with uh, with Trump being the winner. So they had to kind of scramble last minute to make a Trump cover when he did eventually win. That goes to show that they weren't really thinking enough steps ahead, right? And obviously, when that news comes out, it paints your organization in a weird way because it makes you look quite partisan. Blah blah blah. But with an artist or an event, I would have every kind of eventuality um, kind of laid out as a plan. Okay, if you do a meal moment, if you have some friction with the art, if you have some friction with the host, if you happen to say something very motivational, everything should have like a branch, right? That you can then kind of spec out a plan and then spec it out week by week with what you're going to drop in terms of content for those whole seven days. And then this next week, the next week, next week. So I guess with T-Pain, he probably had a, a, a bigger, a big turnout for his last event at this location and his team probably thought they could just throw it out there and it would completely sell out and unfortunately it doesn't and i think it's similar to like the beyonce surprise album drop that happened when she dropped um not is it lemonade i think it might be lemonade right and it kind of really went really well and everyone was going crazy for it oh, that everyone with the pink letters i forgot the name of it uh might have just been beyonce right or yonce or something i don't know what the album was but 
there was a time when that kind of spurned because you know artists are kind of you know the most artists are copycats or lacking in originality or they're just afraid to make their own original move in case it kind of fucks up and the label goes hey you fucked up you're off my fucking roster so labels or artists tend to kind of copy whoever the big brother or sister is in the industry or the leading person so that if it does flop they can just point to like hey but he done it right so it's the industry standard but you know that's not really how you really push culture forward by just copying the next man or woman um it's good to kind of take your own kind of lead on that one so i guess t-pain did that sort of thing and it kind of didn't work out for him um let's hear a bit of the video of him basically breaking it down again i'm surprised that people are surprised i'm i'm more surprised that people are surprised that this happens and I'm also more surprised that people are shocked that he told the truth about it. Because, you know, especially nowadays with social media and stuff, you want to be more honest and more vulnerable with your fans. And it, ironically enough, this will probably endear him to more people that weren't even fans of his in the first place. And they want to support his next um, outing when he does d decide to go and tour again. And people, they're going to come out in their droves, I assume. But let's hear what he has to say. And we can come back on the other side. <laughs> about the one up dlc tour let me just start by saying that my team set up the tour in september and uh if you've ever set up a whole month long tour before you'd know that's not enough time to set up a full tour so um some things got cut some corners got cut uh production went missing uh you know i, I wasn't as hands-on with the planning and things as i should have been because i've been busy as hell and I just thought since, you know, the first one up tour went well and sold out every city, then this should be good. But having said that, uh, I'm going to take it upon myself to cancel the one up DLC tour because it just would have been a bad look for me and it wouldn't have been entertaining for y'all. So uh, I'd, I'd rather just leave it for a later time. Now, let me tell you. I which is good, right? And I guess that, you know what I'm thinking about, thinking about this, right? Um, number one, he's a great dude. He's taking, he's actually uh explaining he's actually explaining himself to his fans which more artists should do um cough cough kanye cough cough playboy carty you know like come on like explain why the album hasn't dropped yet explain why you're stringing your fans along explain right don't just treat your fans like shit because eventually that stuff's gonna wear out as you're probably gonna see with kanye when those album sales come from i'll be very interested to see what the kind of dip happens without kanye's albums because i don't think it's gonna be as good as he thinks it's gonna be and again like Anyway, whatever. There's too many questions there. Um, I think t pain did himself in that way. But also, what this kind of brings home to me or kind of makes me think about, I remember saying in previous podcasts, I think there's a lot of people out there, especially younger people who see this, you know, who are very infused or getting infatuated with the whole hip-hop scene in general. And they, instead of looking at it as an industry, they look at it only through the lens of the artist and the person in front of the camera. And inevitably, they all want to be singers or rappers. Whereas I think the, the fact that hip-hop has now become the number one genre in the world, I think it's now more important than ever for the kids coming up to decide that they don't only want to be part of, they don't only want to be in front of the camera, they want to be part of the overall scene, right? So I really encourage kids to go behind the camera. I encourage them to start their own little local community clubs or local night spots or local nights where they play local artist music or put on shows for local artists. I, I encourage them to be managers, to be agents, to be bookers, to do like even the bare bones stuff like accounting, graphic design, uh, booking manager, just all those kind of things that, that make an artist's life easy so that he can, because essentially, so T-Pain can just be in a studio, perfecting his craft, rehearsing, um, you know, whatever it may be, like just being an artist so that all the other stuff is set up so that when he comes to a show, he's able just to do his best, his best, he, he's able to perform um at the high level at the thing that he's really good at because what he's really good at is making music and performing he's not really good at putting a show together or making flyers or selecting an artist to put a flyer together or where to post on social media or marketing in general or advertising or um you know pr that's not his talent his talent is being the artist so i think i think hopefully this video or videos like this will go a long way to inspire kids to show you that as much as you think these top artists have their shit together, they don't really because, in general, all the good people are only reserved for the top one percenters. If you're a, the biggest high-ticket artist out there, like a Drake, a Rihanna, or a Kanye, you're always going to attract or you're always going to be given the best talent. So all the people underneath have to kind of, like, fight for the scraps, right? Whether it's um, fighting to get your artwork back from the in-house graphic design team, whether it's trying to figure out how to get a fucking graphic in the first place, you're fighting for scraps. But when you're the top percent people, now when you're going to attract the the talent they're going to just slide into your inboxes and number two the label is just going to give them to you so they can make sure they make so they can make sure they make an, a return on the investment or just double their, their money they're they invested on you 
Um, so I think it's really important for kids to see this sort of stuff and be like, you know what? I'm going to get involved. I'm going to go to my local artist. Instead of trying to learn how to rap, I'm going to become their graphic designer. I'm going to um, design a flyer for them free of charge. I'm going to help them with filming their show. I'm going to maybe record something for them on Instagram and post it. What well, Loads of stuff like that can really work well. Or, or, or even set up a, sta- a fan account for somebody on social media. That will go a long way too to kind of um, spread the word of the artist going forward. I think those things really, really help. Um, so again, big up, big up to T-Pain for saying this. Um, it's really commendable, especially now with um, how the Kanye album debacle has gone through. Playboy Carti less so because, you know, it was quite vague. Playboy Carti was meant to drop a whole lot already. It hasn't dropped yet, but the post was quite vague. Um, it's, now been debu- uh, it's, it's now been disputed that whether or not he actually meant he was going to drop the album or whether or not he meant he was working four days straight trying to make the album right. But as well, it's Playboy Carti. He tends to not really put any information out when it comes to his music. He's quite low-key and mysterious. So when it when it gets announced, it gets announced. But the Kanye thing, it's like, come on, do you know what I mean? It was meant to drop one day. It doesn't drop at all, no explanation. Then suddenly now, it's still not dropped. It's the twenty fifth. It's the twenty what six nine. Still hasn't dropped. Like supposedly he's not gonna wait. It's gonna wait until it's uh. It's too, it, I think I saw a tweet recently. Are we gonna wait? We're not gonna leave the studio until this album's done. It's like so yeah, a lack of really understanding or a lack of you know clarity with your consumers. I don't know how long that all kind of lasts, but you know what can I? What, who am I to say? But um, let's listen to the rest of it. I was advised to lie about this and say that I needed some time or I needed some alone time or me time (laughs) and uh, some shit like that or... You know, some I need time to spend my family or some medical attention or something like that. Imagine the record label trying to tell you to throw yourself under the bus on the back of... That's what... So the record label wanted him to exploit mental health because obviously he's gone through... I think T-Pain's gone through some stuff like that. He's spoken about it in passing. So the record label wanted him to tap into his own issues that he's had privately or things that he's actually going through that are real or even talk about stuff to do with his family if there are things that are well known within the T-Pain fandom that he's gone through with his family. They wanted him to tap into that in order for him to get out of not explaining that his, his tour is not going, he's not, he's not going well because his team decided to put it on last minute and didn't, the tickets didn't return the value. It's like, come on, like our record labels are disgusting, isn't it? Imagine that. Record labels are disgusting. They're trying to get a grown man to lie about his mental health or to pretend he's got some sort of family emergency to get out telling his friends that, hey, I organized the, 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 the concert too late or the tour too late. My team fucked up. We fucked up. And, you know, it's not going to be a good show. I don't want to make a shitty show. So I'm going to cancel it and come back around and come back on the other side. It's not that big of a deal, really. If you're a fan of T-Pain, you'd much rather him take his time and put the great show together, especially if you're a fan of T-Pain after listening to that NPR Tiny Desk um, concert thing, right? You're not going to want to see him perform somewhere and it'd be a pay in comparison to that. So, you know, and also, well, he doesn't really want to risk the... He doesn't want to take a gamble on going out on the show or going out to do a tour and it, it being shit and then losing whatever fans he had left in the first place because, you know, he's not as big as he was previously. And also the fans that he's kind of recently cultivated through his personality, just through the stuff that he's done in interviews, like just for being a cool dude, the stuff that he does on Twitch. Like, why risk all of that just so you can appease the internet or appease your record label? It's insane, isn't it? Like that. Just don't, just make, just don't make it look like we fucked up. We fucked up. <laughs> we fucked up. I'm going to keep it real with y'all, man. Jesus That's not... Christ. I know, and most artists lie. When whenever, of course they do. Whenever uh, concerts get canceled or or tours get canceled, it's it's for low ticket sales. It ain't really about. But we know this though, as 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 fans. I think most discerning, again, most discerning fans, most fans who have like their finger on a pulse, most fans who are tapped in, who don't just look at stuff through the surface levels, are aware that when when concerts get canceled, unless the like the A Boogie one in in the UK, I think there's two shows, right? I think the show on Tuesday got cancelled. Is it? I'm pretty sure. Two or three shows. One got cancelled. So you can, you know, you're fairly, uh, you're fairly sure that the second show got cancelled because, you know, maybe he got caught with weed or, you know, he didn't like something with the venue. Something happened in terms of that, right? But if a person doesn't just cancel the tour, like with a month left or with a couple of weeks left until the thing goes off, it's usually because the ticket sales aren't great. Because usually when they put a tour together, the the the, the people that agree the contracts or the venue. They usually have a clause in there where if you cancel it, you get penalized, right? But if your fee far outweighs the penalization fee, you can probably take that hit, especially if it means that you're not going to perform in front of a half empty stadium across uh, on the other side of the country, right? You don't want to do that. No one wants to, especially in the day, age of Instagram. No one wants someone to take a picture of their crowd and it be half empty and it look like you're not winning, right? On social, because that's what everyone cares about, the image. But 
again, why, like, I, I just don't understand. I don't get it. But yeah, uh, big up T-Pain. A lot of credit to the dude, man, for taking that stance. Very honourable of him. And I'm sure, like, this whole issue anyway would probably end up um, affecting him in the in a, in a positive way. I'm sure people are now going to be bigger fans of T-Pain. And now his record label will then come back around the other side. But of course, see, we knew it was a good idea to say that, actually, and be honest up front with your fans. Like, go fuck off. Record labels are disgusting, man. Imagine trying to get a, a, a grown-up adult artist like if maybe it's a younger artist fair enough because you don't want them to be discouraged and feel like no one wants to listen to, i don't know this something else there's another game there but to an artist has been in the game for a long time like t-pain why does he have to why does he have to go down that road there's no need for it like yeah my t- like you know we didn't plan enough ahead of time and ticket sales aren't going where they should be going so we're gonna cancel it cool no one come back on the other side come back on the other side no no biggie Really, really strange way to go about things, but again, record labels are disgusting. I keep telling you this. So, um, next on here, let's talk about Kanye West because uh, you know why not? Um, Kanye West gave an interview with um, Zayn Lowe. He's yet to drop Jesus King album. So Kanye West has done a few things that have been questionable over the last few years, I'd say, or last couple of years. Um, I've got I've gotten to a point where I've been able to separate the artist from the art, um, from the art from the artist, right? Um. I've kind of done that in all my life anyway with everyone I've kind of looked up to. And I think in general, because I've just been exposed to, you know, different intellectuals, I've kind of read different books, I've watched documentaries, I've gone to conferences, I've gone to talks. I've just surrounded myself with other forms of um, motivation, inspiration, information, insight, guidance and mentorship from afar. I don't necessarily go to Kanye for all of my, for all of that sort of stuff. So it kind of, if anything, because I've been so exposed to so much of that stuff, it's made whatever I hear Kanye say sound really incoherent and stupid. Now, that's not to say that I wasn't also part of the bandwagon that was, you know, jacking him off when, you know, when he was talking about fashion and stuff, because I was, right? I was part of that that group because at that era, especially when he was going through all the drama he was going through to get Yeezy um, where it needs to be at now, I kind of saw that battle as something quite honourable, right? Something quite important for the culture for the scene in general, for all us creatives out there, for all us wannabe creatives, because it was like he was fighting against a machine. He got he peered behind the curtain, he realized that the only way to get his brand or his company to a level of perfection or the level of production quality or to Stella McCartney or these kind of people was to partner up with one of the big conglomerates, right? Kering and LVMH, all the others. There's the only way to get forward because they've got a monopoly, they've got like a, a, a vice-like grip on all the best factories, and all the best manufacturing, all the best materials. So the only way to do it is to kind of partner up with a company or to kind of get favor of those of those groups. Um, and he was kind of wailing about it because he realized that, you know, these mediocre, quote unquote, um, designers or artists are getting away with murder because they just got the keys to the best production plant. But do they have the, don't necessarily have the best ideas? <sighs> so that fight was cool. On a, that I was I was well for it. I was on it. And he was talking, you know, he was quite lucid. He seemed very cognitive. He seemed very aware. But then over time, I don't know, he's gone down a weird path. Um, maybe it was triggered because of his um, support with Trump and the kind of backlash he received in it was a bit was a bit harsh. Um, it also maybe was something very surprising because, you know, if you're a narcissist or you're a, a sociopath like Kanye, you probably don't think, you probably have a very skewed uh, impression of your own, of how you're perceived. So I think it was probably the first time he really noticed that the people that he thinks will always ride for him don't really ride for him. I think even when he did the Taylor Swift stuff, he was kind of aware that, you know, hip hop was rooting for him when he did whatever else he did that's questionable. People were, you know, hip hop was generally aware for him. But the moment he started siding with Trump, it seemed like hip hop in general, the industry, especially people behind the scenes, kind of distanced themselves from him and kind of, you know, put the brakes in that relationship or just let it be known that he's not their guy anymore, especially in an era where every entertainer or celebrity has turned into like a, a politician or an activist on social media. Um, he probably saw, he, he was very probably taken aback by, it. oh my God, shit, I'm on my own completely, right? Coupled that with the fact that Virgil completely, you know, went to the moon and back um, with his appointment to Louis Vuitton. Um, the fact that he doesn't really hang out with any other of those kind of dudes that are part of that scene. I've, ne- I've not seen him, I've not seen a picture of Kanye with um, Don C in fucking years. I'm not sure if that's a thing, if they're talking or not. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, obviously, falling out with Drake was a big thing. So he's gone through quite a lot of stuff, but I've just tended to kind of push, take it, you know, just keep it at arm's length and kind of do my own thing. Um, I don't necessarily listen to the music anymore. I think Kids the Ghost was pretty cool. The gay album was trash, completely lit. I skipped through it and just kind of, you know, binned it for the most part. But I'm not really looking forward to Kanye album, especially even more so now he's on his Jesus tip or his Jesus um, era flex. I'm just not with it whatsoever. I have a very fraught and fractious relationship with the church. I have grew up in it. I went through a few, you know, weird times in the church, stuff that I don't really want to repeat. 
Um, or I don't really want to, you know, kind of expound on in that regard, but just really troubling times. I'm not really a fan of, especially black churches, of how they exploit um, the weak, um, how they prey upon people who have no other option. It happens a lot in Africa, especially, you know, the prosperity message is something that kind of grips um, loads of members of my family because they don't have anything and they can't see a way out. And when somebody comes on a pulpit dressed well with a gold watch and a big car and tells you, you know, give me this money or do this and do that. And then you're suddenly going to get what you want in life. It seems like the way to go, isn't it? It brings you solace. It brings you peace. But in general, you're getting exploited by these people right? who look like you, which is the other thing that really drives me crazy. But in general, I'm just I'm just I abhor it. And especially in in context in context too, I abhor it because I think a lot of people say, "Oh, Kanye says these stupid things," but a lot of these fans be like, "Oh man, you you got to see his comment in context." Cool, but you also have to see his actions in context, right? Because I always think to myself, like, what would have happened if the whole Trump thing and the whole four hundred years of slavery and all that sort of stuff? What happened if all those comments gone, went down well? What happens if he didn't get any backlash? Would he have corrected course? Would he have um, gone down? Would he have corrected course, quote unquote, and gone down the church route? I don't think he would have. I think he panicked. I think he was crazed, as as he probably mentioned. He went to, um, he went to a mental institute. I think he would have, he would have went down that way. Um, I think he would have not gone to church if people would have been game or been okay with him standing next to Trump and saying that, hey, this guy's like my dad. All this sort. Could not again. No one cares if you like Trump or not. But the way it kind of unraveled just showed that he wasn't very cognitive of himself. Oh no, he was very aware of his kind of influence and power and he was just basically goading people with the hat and stuff. He was, you know, remember that comedy meant about, oh, don't let me get the hat out again, right? Um, like he gave the box of hats to Ryan Fest, but now he's threatening in this interview again with Zane Lowe to bring the hats back out again and saying the hats are part of a practical joke. It's just essentially, he's taking the piss out of his fans. Um, he's essentially got to a point where it looks like to me, I think as he mentioned it quite a few times, that like Yeezy is a billion dollar company. I think he's got to a point where he's got he fuck you money and he's really flexing. He's finally been, he's finally realized that, because you remember there was an interview with The Breakfast Club where Kanye was talking a lot about financial wealth and independence and having money and money and money. And, kind, and then I think Shalman was like, why do you keep talking about money for? This isn't the Kanye that I know. You're obsessed with money. But I think what Kanye realized once he tapped into the Kardashians was that, the Kardashians in some some respects, again, not to link this to Kanye, but because they're probably st- separate entities, but the Kardashians in some respect probably showed Kanye West just how important it is to have fuck you money, just how important it is to have, um, to, be in, to be in charge of your own future, just how important it is to be the captain of your own ship. Because over the years, they've done loads of questionable things, things that people have tried to cancel them over, have tried to kind of end their quote unquote social quote unquote to try to look there are lots of things that people have done they've done in general as a family the questions that people don't really like but nothing seems to stick if you have not found if you're not a fan of them nothing nothing they do that's questionable seems to kind of you know uh derail their path to you know just gr- cashing in cashing in cashing in every year it just go up and up and up and up and up and up in terms of bank account or in terms of what they can do with their money in terms of influence in terms of culture influence and in terms of brand partnerships all that sort of stuff so i think Kanye finally got to a point where he realized that now with yeezy being valued at a billion dollar company you can probably dispute that i dispute that i'm not too sure how real that figure is but if you go to any much city and you look around the streets so you look down on what people are wearing you'll see yeezys everywhere mom dad kid hype beast non-hype beast everyone's wearing them so that probably has some sort of validity to it but again whether or not it could all come through the trainers is hard to do that just through footwear but you know it could probably happen especially through such a limited range of foot or foot, footwear options but you know who am i to argue this but i think he's finally got that money and he's seen that oh wow i can say what the fuck i want and these none of these guys can touch me because i think a lot of people also out there apart from the kanye there's a lot more i think it's fair to say that if you're a billion dollar if you're a billion dollar valued sneaker company it probably has more to do with the sneakers being good than it has to do with people being fans of Kanye. I don't think there's a lot of people out there. I think there's a lot of people out there. If you saw them wearing Yeezys and you looked on their phone and checked their Spotify, checked their iTunes, they probably haven't listened to a Kanye West track in probably a couple of years or in a year and a half. Or maybe it's some, you know what I mean? I don't think necessarily all Yeezy fans are Kanye fans. So a lot of people out there have realized they want to separate the art from the artist. So Kanye's probably felt that and realized that he's very, you know, he's very intuitive in that way, emotionally. So he's probably wilding out because of that, right? Maybe, I don't know. But I just think in general, for the fans that are still sticking around, it must it must fucking suck, isn't it? Like, this is a video or an article from High Snobiety, and it details his performance that he did at LA at the forum, where he kind of did a whole weird listening party thing that a lot of artists do nowadays that gets on my nerves. They go to an... They, it, I, 
I get the whole listening party thing. I get the whole like a focus group, right? Intimate crowd. I think it probably works best when it's like a small concentrated crowd of influencers and stuff. Like I, I think that might have been, what is it? Same, was it, was it Jesus? When they did that, right? When all, when, it, when they got like all like um, Lucas Sabat and all those guys to go to some hotel bar somewhere and they were playing the music, right? That, that works pretty well. I think that's a really cool and way to kind of get your music viral, right? You have all those cool kind of influencer guys, Bloody Osiris, Lucas Sabat, um, you know, um, ASAP Nas, all these kind of guys um, at your listing party and they're kind of live streaming your, perf- sorry, they're kind of, um, yeah, IG living your kind of session and then people are clipping those clips and putting it up on YouTube and stuff or sharing them again on social and Twitter and stuff. That works really well, but playing an entire album that no one's heard of gospel raps to a, a stadium full of kids that, all they know, all they want to hear is fucking, you know, stuff from Jesus and I don't know, my beautiful Dutch Twisted Fantasy is a bit strange. I never really got that. Second, like second, like even in the concert, why do people play, why do people play unreleased songs at concerts? Like it just completely kills the vibe. I, I never really understood that in my respect. But anyway, what do I know? So this whole article about his event at Forum Las Vegas, um, the vinyl itself looks pretty cool. I like it's a blue vinyl. Again, the albums are out. The funny thing about this whole rollout is that the merch came out, the interview with um, Zayn Lowe came out, him speaking for two hours, just talking absolute shit. But the album itself hasn't come out yet, so this kind of again lends it lends itself to the idea of like what what how can you be a fan of Kanye? Like he's got an album full of gospel raps, right? It's only ten tracks. It's not like he's you know he's going on like he's fucking designing I don't know um, the Starship, right? The SpaceX Starship with Elon Musk. He's not doing that, right? He's design he's fucking putting together an album, and it's and it's an album of 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 probably tunes some of which were meant to be on the Yandy album that have been now remastered, edited, and kind of you know, chopped and changed to kind of fit in with his new perspective on life and his new kind of religious quest because he can't rap about some of the stuff he did previously. But it's just insane that the album's still not out yet. It's like a 10-track album. Like, really, how hard is it to get that out? It's like, you felt you you missed one drum drop date and it's the second drop date you're going to miss again. It's like, insane. So, yeah, but um, I like the lanyard. It's, um, the I think the actual rollout itself is quite cool, going into a stadium. and Even though I'm not a fan of it, um, going to a stadium and doing this whole thing is pretty cool. Um, the lanyard of the actual vinyl looks amazing. He had a, what is it? He had like an installation artist do this weird grass thing. That was pretty cool. Um, you can check that video, little video there. There's like a grass installation there that people are standing in, which is insane, right? That was pretty interesting. Someone got Kanye's hat. All these kids here, like, you know, begging for Kanye to sign their merch. Which is weird, and again, this is visually, as optics-wise, this is quite interesting, right? It's Jesus is king. He's hoping to bring people through to Christianity or get them rele- or get them saved like he's saved. But all these kids are worshipping Kanye. They're not worshipping God. They're not worshipping Jesus. They're worshipping Kanye. Kanye is the one that they care about. They don't care about the Jesus stuff. They just want to get next to Kanye and get the bit of that stardust on them. That's all they care about, which is funny, isn't it? Like, it's like, what did you expect, man? That celebrity is going to fire out. Like, it's never going to be in balance at all. But again, what do I know? Um, it continues some more pictures of people at the event some great little videos and stuff you can check out yourself but the most interesting part of it is the interview with Zane Lowe now don't get me wrong I haven't watched the whole thing I've probably watched about 20 minutes of it it's quite hard to get through it because again I'm a big Kanye fan and to see he, see where he's at now at the moment uh, mentally to see where he's at now as a person it just kind of it just kind of makes me sad that he's turned into this dude um, again, your artist, you're not going to be, always be a fan of your artist the whole the rest of your life, but you can, uh, I guess this is a natural progression, you know? Um, and again, like I mentioned before, he's hip hop's Morrissey. Hip hop never had a Morrissey yet. I don't think such a divisive figure. I think indie fans or fans of um, quote unquote white people music have a lot of these personalities in there. People who are quite, you know, questionable, questionable human beings, but they make fucking great art. And Kanye is probably the first in the hip hop industry in that regard, right? Universally, you could play, you know, a Kanye West track for most people. And they would they would know at least one or two of his tracks, so you know, universally loved. But unfortunately, for some of us who were fans of him when he was a fearless leader of the creatives, has now turned into like a Bible thumping, you know, born again Christian. You're like, oh, man. But again, people have what people are, you know, they're allowed to do what they can do. Um, you know, fame isn't a prison. Artists are allowed to grow and evolve into the people that they want to become. Cool, and it's up to you as a fan to decide if you want to jump on that, kind of continue that journey. No problem with me. But the interview itself is just like insane. Some of the quotes, right? So this is from the wrap up. There's some tidbits of this interview that he's given with Zayla. I'm not going to play it because it's probably going to get uh, flagged or whatever. But I'll play some other bits and pieces that I found. But here's some choice quotes, right, from the interview that kind of just left me a bit you know speechless to say the least um let's go here so 
this is from the wrap up right their, their um, Twitter page it's got some quotes here from the Kanye West interview so scroll down and see them from the bottom and go all the way up right uh, <laughs> number one right number one tweet here that, that they've mentioned is that Kanye said the following I was literally out there trying to have my daughter outdress Rihanna which again is out of context we don't know what he's talking about but it's just nuts, right? Now, now you comment, number one. Number two, I thought I was a god of culture, but really, subculture was my god. Okay, cool. So that means he was essentially trying to, you know, get North to dress, you know, better than Rihanna, um, and which meant he was obsessing in, over materialism, over culture in general. This is something that we were aware of. It's not that big of a deal. Cool, it moves on. Uh, Kanye says he didn't make any money off his uh, Yeezus tour which is interesting. We don't really care about that. Um, Kanye on social media. People are addicted to it. It's the modern day cigarettes. Whatever. Kanye on running his present 2024. Um, we're working on some things right now. Like what? Is he actually trying to run for to be president? That is insane. But again, it's not It's not out of bounds or between, you know, what Kanye thinks of himself. And if you, if you tell Kanye he can't do something, he's going to do it. I think we saw with a hat. The moment people started telling him not to wear the hat, he wore it even more. So it's just one of those things. You just have, the more it's kind of like a child. You have to ignore him for a bit, and then you just stop doing it because no one's giving him any attention. So you know, we see it. And also, you never know. Twenty twenty four is a long way away, right? He could, he could have a metamorphosis and change again to another person, and then suddenly he becomes someone everyone loves again. We don't know. Kanye says the following. Kanye says he now owns his own masters. We're happy for him from that. Another quote. He says, "Kanye, I'm unquestionably, undoubtedly, the greatest human artist of all time. It's just that fact." Cool. That's again. Is that at odds with his new Christian perspective? Um, should he more should he be should he be more humble? I don't know. Whatever it may be, he might argue that some of the biggest preachers in the world, you know, drive Lexuses and flying, you no, know, or drive fucking Maybachs and roll. Man, Lexus is not people on it. Drive Rolls Royces and Maybachs and flying private jets. So probably him having confidence in his own ability isn't that far off from those kind of actions. I'm not too sure. Maybe a false equivalency. I don't know. Uh, Kanye says on Drake. Um, I go to Drake's house. I walk over there with no security and leave my phone number. He's here's my cell. I'm not trying to ring the bell. I'm not trying to ring the bell. It's like the the Drake thing. We know for sure, looking from the outside in, that Drake is done with Kanye, right? I think a lot of people in the industry are done with Kanye for the fact that you don't really see them hanging around with him too much. You don't see them retweeting his stuff. Um, all the hangers on that have kind of joined him so far are the ones that are kind of um, co opted the whole Yeezy um, design studio thing and want to job that way. And again, if you want to be part of his CV, if you want to get him on your CV, it's probably a good look to get other jobs. So kids are just trying to forego all the madness he's saying and just kind of trying to work in the studio intern, get that experience and then bounce. The people that are also begging, it looks like from the outside in, look like people that are trying to join the gospel crier and be part of that. Um, so you can get musically next to him that way because, you know, maybe it was harder to get in touch with Kanye when he was going, when he was in full Yeezus, full My Beautiful Talk, Twisted Mode because he was only, only hitting up the best of the best to kind of make his albums amazing. So that probably works out. And all the, all the other people that I mentioned previously, like the Don C's and all the other guys and the, and the IBM Jespers, I'm not seeing him around Kanye in fucking yonks, right? It's only these new kind of, you know, um, hangers on that are kind of now trying to get some Kanye stardust on them. But then another thing that made me, made me wonder this was when I watched the video. So there's a video here on the Team Kanye daily Twitter page that kind of is, again, a bit distressing because you see Kanye and he looks, he just looks nuts. Do you know what I mean? Like, and what he's saying is nuts as well. So there's a couple of videos here. Let me see if I can find it. Um, da, 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 da. Video number one. Let's see if he says anything nutty in here. So this is number one video, right? on there. Let's see if it's anything too bad. I don't think it is, but let's see if it is. That I'm in service to Christ, mm -hmm. my job is to spread the gospel. I'm no longer a slave. I'm a son now, son of God. <laughs> Do you guys really buy this? Is anyone buying any of this? Like, honestly, like, this is such a, like, it's amazing, bro. Honestly, if that Trump thing would have worked, right, and somehow in a parallel universe, he says what he says about Trump, he says all the 400 years of slavery thing, and um, Van Leef, instead of getting up and chastising him, says, oh my God, I'm so thankful you spoke the truth. You spoke power into truth or power, whatever, right? Like, if it went the way he wanted it to go, would he have done this? Would he have gone down this whole spirituality route? He probably wouldn't have done this. He would be standing on a convention uh, uh, stage with Trump now, pumping his fist in the air and fucking performing uh, Jesus Walks or something. That's what he'd be doing, isn't it? He wouldn't be on this path of, like, redemption and forgiveness and you know, um, healing and spirituality, he wouldn't be doing this. This is obviously a play to make sure he can, he holds onto his base, which is essentially, you know, the black audience, but the black audience seem like they're done with him. I think so for the most part. I don't know whether or not you guys think the same thing, but 
I wouldn't want any Kanye juice on me whatsoever. Outside of the whole artistic side of it. Just in terms of a, as a person. He's just going through too much now. Remember, he's going through too much. And again, maybe is it irresponsible for me to sit down to Kanye and interview him now as well? Whereas he's going through this stuff. Like, I don't even know if he's of sane mind. But that being said, um, a lot of people criticize Zane Lowe for having the most softball, low bar, low brow, sort of like, you know, you know, doesn't really push back to on his on his guests, kind of in the same vein as they kind of push back to... In this, the same way people say, like, he plays defense, like a Phil DeFranco or like a Dave Rubin in the interviews. I also think this is the reason why they're important because when it comes to interviewing like people who are eccentric like Kanye, you need a Zane Lowe person there to interview him because once you have like, if you have an Ebro or a Charlemagne, people with outsized egos who want to insert themselves in a conversation, this conversation, this, this interview is going to go off the rails in two seconds. You need to have, you need to have a, you need to have a Zane Lowe who's just going to sit there and be like, wow, man, that's crazy. Oh, real right, interesting. You know what I mean? You need to have someone like that who's just going to let him speak and just, you know, and also be at ease and be at peace because you know Zay Lowe's not going to try and have a gotcha moment. It'd be interesting to see if Charlemagne does end up interviewing him too, actually. Would Charlemagne do that? I don't know. Um, nowadays, maybe he's more aware of how this whole mark, this whole mental health marketing thing is kind of looking for him. I don't know. I wonder if he'll do it. Let's continue this video. I'm free. But this shows you that God is hilarious. Why? Liberals love art, mm -hmm. right? And now... I am unquestionably, undoubtedly, the greatest human artist of all time. It's just a fact, right? So to put a red hat on was like God's oh. practical joke right. on all liberals. Right, 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 right. <laughs> like, yeah. And, yeah, and that's why it hurt. Not Kanye! And that's why it hurts so much. <laughs> you are held up as this person who continues to provide us. But those, but those, liberals, those liberals never. No, fans, man, fans. We, we are the same human beings. We are gods. And that man versus machine is... So he says liberals uh, were freaking out. Like that's, a, that's not even a funny joke, but I think Zaynab did a good pushback there. How can you say, one way, in one sense, you're calling lib them liberals. You're trying to like ostracize them as these people. But they are your fans. Your fans were disappointed in you for siding with Trump because they don't like Trump. So again, like his lack of understanding and perspective, and again, it's very worrying, but you know... People of people of um, height and notoriety and popularity have this thing in them. It's just a common thing. Maybe it's a detachment from society. It kind of makes you like that. But he's just lacking in self awareness, uh, you know, in its own, which is you know whatever it is. But if you're a fan of Kanye, watching this must make you a bit bummed out, really. You know what I mean? Um, continues another video here too. What do you say here? They try to discriminate hey. against my mind and my thoughts <laughs> because of that moment. Kobe Bryant has won five championships. His story isn't pulling an Achilles. The same press, they wanna make the conversation always be about mental health. They're trying to kill the superhero. <laughs> so I'm here to show that someone that's diagnosed can still drive and be I don't think anyone, again, he's just, just pointing out the obvious. Who, who, who thinks when someone has a mental breakdown, they can't come back from it? We love a redemption, we love a redemption, a redemption story. Um, Racks of Riches, um, the Phoenix Re-Rising, um, The Hero's Journey, Joseph Campbell, Big Up. We, we love that story in society. I don't know why he's making it seem as if like people are writing him off because he had a mental breakdown. If anything, people are writing him off because he said wacky shit, had a mental breakdown. Um, he was said that he was seeking clarity had another said that more wacky shit has now gone to Christianity and now is saying even more wacky shit. He's just continually saying dumb things and he's dumbfounded that people are reacting weird oddly or reacting negatively to the dumb things that he's saying. It's again, it's just such a warped way of looking at stuff. Like he's just completely only looking at it from his own point of view, which again is his superpower because that's Kanye West. But for a fan, it must bum you out. Um, let's so you see one more clip here. California, building my domes mm. and they said my dome was 10 feet too high <laughs> right that makes so if you're not familiar with the story Kanye made these domes these um these um prototypes of homes that he was intending to build on his own pro on his own land in order to kind of you know it's his kind of idea of rehousing people in disaffected areas or just providing alternative means of housing you can read into it google it you'll find it and essentially, um, the local planning office in LA told him to tear them down because they didn't they weren't up to spec. That's it, right? Now again, you can read into it what you want to read into it. He mentions here that 
the they told him it was 10 feet too high he had to tear it down and that the story was leaked to the press and now he's looking at it at some conspiracy theory right they leaked it to the press so that he had no choice but to tear it down because he was kind of forced to and it was you know embarrassed i don't know whatever it may be but if you look at the story in isolation just kind of break it down for what it is he had his own property he had his own land but he didn't even bother to find out what the building regulations were before he built his dome he just built it and then he realized and then he was told it was too high to tear it down cool but he's now taking that as some sort of symbolism as to why people are trying to block his mind like his mind is so high above everyone else again this is somebody that doesn't read right he specifically said he doesn't read he's not informed he rabbits or parrots the views of others around him in order to kind of um, and then tr and tries to kind of filter it through his own perspective in order to kind of form his own opinion he's not informed right he suddenly woke up whenever when the whole cultural war was going on and left me right he suddenly saw this stuff was going on and just inserted himself into it no one asked for his opinion on anything that was happening right he inserted himself into it had some incredibly horrible takes or the the takes that the majority of the audience wouldn't of his audience wouldn't be susceptible to and he was not prepared for the backlash again like how can you imagine being imagine being as smart or as um um or as looking like as smart as you are as kanye right and not having it and not thinking 10 10 steps ahead not as not assuming that imagine you're kanye you're sitting there you're like you know what, i'm gonna come out and i'm gonna start backing trump how can it not pass your brain that some of your fans might not think that's a good might be against your backing of trump of what he represents of who he is or the part your backs whatever your thinking is i don't really give a shit because i'm not america it's not my stuff to get involved in but imagine not thinking about that having that playing that scenario in your head about your fans maybe freaking out and not being fans and not being down with that um your family your wife your friends um the industry in general just imagine not having that because that's the reason why a lot of people say there's not there's probably more conservative people in hollywood than we know because really hollywood for the most part is leans quite to the left and, and a lot of actresses and actors and movie directors and producers don't want to declare their let's say don't want to declare what side they are on the party line because they don't want it to impact on their ability to land a job essentially right to book a next gig so people just stay quiet and keep the politics behind closed doors or if you're in if you're in the in crowd in la you'll hear around the party scene and shit that you'll know that you know some people lean this way politics wise you'd be surprised who these people are i hear a lot through in podcasts like read between lines there are a lot more conservative people in hollywood than you think but no one wants to come and say because they don't want to get cancelled imagine being kind of just assuming that people are just going to be receptive to what you say and just take it with a grain of salt mate you, that, you you're, you're not that important like i don't understand why you'd think that you would be immune to getting some level of criticism from people like and, and the fact that he didn't even think about it and didn't plan didn't have a kind of a coherent argument in place right a coherent counter argument some facts and figures um just something in place to kind of respond to that backlash just shows just how reckless he was with his with his kind of influence i say with maybe um how careless he was with his fans emotions and feelings maybe in that regard as well like just dismissing of it like no this is my path i'm on and if, if you're a fan of me you're just gonna you're just gonna back me anyway regardless it's like that's not how it works man you should know that more than anyone right um yeah it's just a strange one they tore it down that kind of semantic but think about what they're saying mm. kanye your dome is mm. too high yeah they're saying it's too high because it's too high just build it in spec like <laughs> so they came to me and said <laughs> This guy's nuts. You have to tear it down. But before I even had the opportunity, now, mind you, this is on my own 300 acre property. Mm. Before I had the opportunity, they already went to press with it. But we all know that, in, especially in America, um, what you call real estate, probably, your land isn't even your land. You're still playing fucking, what's that? There's, there's a tax you have to pay, even when you buy your own land or you buy your own house or building. Like, you still have to pay something to Uncle Sam. It's not necessarily technically yours to do whatever you want with it. There's still some, you still have to abide by some rules and regulations anyone that's watched grand designs will know this like it's not as if you can build as long as you buy a plot of land you can make something what you can you can make your building look like whatever it has to fit within the environment there's buildings there's building regulations there's stuff that you have to kind of put in place just the way it is and he's looking at that as some kind of um what you call it example of how people are treating him in terms of his political views and shit like what again man it gives me a headache to listen to it i'm gonna stop it for there because again the hours passed now and i got head off to work um but yeah that's kanye west man the album still hasn't come out so again i'm not sure if you're a fan and this is what you want from kanye but i'm off that train i buy the shoes i buy the clothing um i keep abreast with how he's 
um, conducting his, uh, or just how the business is running in terms of Yeezy, right? In terms of the marketing approach, in terms of the design process. Um, that's cool, quite cool. It's, especially if you're a graphic designer, it's quite interesting to kind of follow the people that are working in the Yeezy Design Studio because they sometimes post up some interesting tidbits and whatever. There's a really cool video actually of some, some Russian dude who's part of the Yeezy Design product team who kind of showed, he did a presentation somewhere in Russia for a university. You can't really understand if you don't listen to understand Russian, but he presented loads of prototypes of stuff that are working. It's really interesting. But apart from that, when it comes to him, his views politically or about social political issues, I don't care. When it comes to his music, I'll pass. Because again, he's number one, he's getting more money in other areas. So I don't think he's putting his all into his music and it's not the best product we're going to get. It's obviously better when he's presenting it for when other people are presenting his 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 artistry for him in Pusha T's album, right? Good example. But to listen to gospel raps from Kanye in 2019, nah, there's too much music out there to do that to myself. I can't do that. I just can't. I refuse. Um so yeah, that's my opinion in that regard. Anyway. That's it for the show. Thanks so much for tuning in. Episode number 242, we're out. Uh, as always, check out my socials, axinozinga.com for all those links there. If you're watching via the YouTube app, please, please give me a little thumbs up. Click subscribe so you can come back to the show a lot of time and maybe click that little notification bell if you want as well to get notified of my new updates. I upload loads of up, I upload loads of clips on here too, so make sure you check the clips playlist for my clips from the show. If you're watching or listening via the, sorry, the podcast app, please give me a five-star review. Help people also to find the show. And, you know, if you see anything on social that I share, repost it so everyone knows who i am and what i'm talking about but until then um obviously have a great weekend you're probably already having one anyway and you're listening to us now so i don't blame you but in case you're not have a good one enjoy yourself and i'll see you guys on the other side take care peace bye